So welcome everyone. Hello to the oh we might need more chairs to the Irish American Heritage Museum. Uh, my name, of course, is Elizabeth Stack. I'm the executive director here, and we're delighted to be with our um, second meeting in Communities for Immunity. We got um, we're, we're part of this program through the American Museum Alliance and the CDC and the Center for Science and Technology. There's a host of different museums throughout the country that are taking part in this kind of pilot program to hopefully combat you know, vaccine hesitancy. And so as part of that, we came up with three different talks. We were doing communities in the pandemic, um, science in the pandemic, which will be on the 30th of November. And tonight is um, history in the pandemic. And so Dr. Karen Sonnenlieser from Sonnenlieser from uh, CN University is going to look at Irish famine fever and how immigrants are sometimes you know kind of misjudged and um particularly around disease that you know they can be kind of blamed for the spread of things uh, on saturday we will have a clinic here a pop-up clinic with uh the vaccine so if it's your first time getting the vaccine you're welcome to come down from about noon on saturday we will also be doing booster shots we will be doing the regular flu shot and we will we hope have you know because now children have been accepted we hope we will have um those doses I should say it will be doctor or do, doctor, he's a pharmacist, John McDonald from Mara's Pharmacy and not myself who's administering the shots. So it will actually be a proper, you know, thing. <laughs> so we're delighted anyway, as I say, to have Dr. Son Anita with us here. She's spoken many times for us at the museum and uh, we're excited about this talk tonight because, you know, Irish people in particular, I think, know what it's like when particularly a poor neighborhood but a marginalized community um you know go through different things and so this pandemic has taught us that as communities we are interdependent we are interlinked um and of course you know this disease has been rampant you know throughout whether you're vaccinated or not and so it's important i think to come together and that's what the community for immunity grant was all about so welcome to dr sonalita and thank you to everybody uh, both online and here. So if anyone on the Zoom has a question, type it in the questions and answers. We'll, the Q&A will do that afterwards. And the same, I think, on YouTube or Facebook, you can share your comments and questions online. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very warm introduction. Hold on. Okay. All right. It's lovely to be back here uh, and speaking on this topic. It's one I, uh, well, it's actually, much as this is sort of horrifying things that we'll be talking about today, it's quite a bit uh, a fun topic for me, at least. Uh, so I'm going to assume uh, that this audience, both online and in person, don't need a ton of introduction about the basic facts of the great hunger. Uh, but for any who do, when we speak about this, historians are referring to the period between 1845 and 1852, which among other things results in a dramatic decrease of the Irish population, which we generally attribute to the I'm going to say this wrong, Phthora infestans, uh, the omocyte, which destroys potato crops for several years beginning in 1845. Um, although uh, to attribute it simply to loss of potatoes would be a bit of an oversimplification. Um, according to the census, the population of Ireland was uh, 8.2 million in 1841, and by 1851, it was down to 6.5 million, uh, which is a drop of about 20%. And it continued to decline in the decades that followed. We attribute that population loss to a combination of the higher death rate within Ireland uh, and emigration. As we will see uh, today, these two factors are actually quite closely connected. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking at the ways in which the famine created epidemic disease within Ireland and within the Irish immigrant population. We'll also discuss how the perception of Irish famine era immigrants as carriers of disease contributed to their reception. Uh, now, today, an individual, um, wait, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, that's, the slides are not going forward, what do I do? <laughs> sorry, let me just shut this thing <laughs> Oh, is that, <laughs> wait. Hmm. Okay, sorry, we're with us technology yeah. people. They are getting it, which is nice. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. Hey, I was trying that. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. There we go. We just had to hit it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right, here we go. Um, okay, 
So today an individual is deemed to have starved to death in the clinical sense, only if they die as a result, and this is very technical, the attrition of protein and fatty deposits in the body causing gradual systemic atrophy, particularly of the heart muscle. Uh, so pure starvation in that sense is actually relatively uncommon. In the 19th century, ideas about medicine are quite different, and it's not always clear what definition doctors are speaking about in that era when they refer to starvation. Uh, there was a category in 19th century medical literature called starvation, and there are also two related categories uh, that show up in death records. Uh, one was called dropsy, uh, which is a swelling of the soft tissue due to fluid accumulation, which often accompanies acute starvation. Um, today, we would associate that with congestive heart failure. Uh, finally, there's another term, marasmus, uh, which was a general term describing the death of infants and small children from some form of food inadequacy. So in death records for the 1840s, it was pretty rare to list that someone dies of starvation, but thousands die of dropsy or marasmus. In 1840, not a famine year, 17 people died of starvation, but 3,000 died of dropsy and 9,000 died of marasmus. So food insecurity is not unique to the period between 1845 and 1852. Now this slide is deaths in, as you see, several counties, Mayo, Clare, Tipperary, Roscommon, and Sligo from 1846 to 1850. So it's kind of the height of the famine years. Um, and as you can note, obviously starvation is listed uh, as a fairly common cause of death, but also we see marasmus uh, and dropsy up there as well. And these other categories uh, we will be getting to tonight. <laughs> um, in 1847, often called Black 47, a little over 6,000 people were reported to have died of starvation, but there are almost a quarter of a million deaths that year. Some of those deaths are dropsy or marasmus, but the reality is that most of these people uh, didn't die specifically of starvation. They died of infectious disease, right? Um, and there are infectious diseases in several different categories. So most deaths are going to be things like dysentery, as you see, um, also fever, which we'll be talking about quite a bit, right? During the famine, these diseases, which were always present endemically in Ireland, swept through the country epidemically, right? And then there are other associated epidemics as well, tuberculosis, bronchitis, influenza, pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, and to cap things off in 1848, cholera. Now, Another important note about mid 19th century medicine is that it predates the, the acceptance of the germ theory of disease. The idea that microorganisms are what cause disease is not really developed until Louis Pasteur in the 1850s, and it's not widely accepted until starting in the 1880s, thanks to the work of Robert Koch. So no one in this period thinks that microorganisms are causing any of these things. Right. Um, Instead, they attribute disease usually to what's called miasma. Miasma theory uh, blamed what they called bad air. Uh, but what they really meant by bad air is bad smelling air. So they blame environmental factors, right? Foul air, poor hygiene. Miasma theory contributes to the stigmatization of disease. The presence of disease among socially marginalized populations was seen as evidence of the inferiority of their lifestyles and habits. And blaming marginalized populations for getting sick was of course a convenient way to avoid addressing the systemic inequalities that contributed to disease amongst these already marginalized populations. So most excess mortality during the famine was caused by um, infectious disease. Um, some of these, and this is broadly true as you can see pretty much every famine throughout history, right? Um, some of these are opportunistic diseases that take advantage of the fall in nutritional status and the general environmental deterioration. Um, individual immunity declines as your body is deprived of food. During a famine, there's a, a threshold effect. A switch occurs uh, in a regime of subnutrition um, to, from where your immune system becomes severely impaired. This effect is often uneven. Um, some diseases are highly sensitive to food intake uh, and others are independent of nutritional status. And many are somewhere in between. Um, one thing that does happen in Ireland and contributes to the widespread uh, epidemics of every infectious disease is that there is also associated scurvy, 
uh, which you can see here, they actually have scurvy listed with starvation, right? So there's a scurvy outbreak in Ireland during the famine because potatoes are among other things, high in vitamin C. <laughs> um, and so Irish diets had been rich in vitamin C, now they are entirely deprived of that. Scurvy is not commonly reported as an exact cause of death, as a direct cause of death during the famine, um, but among other things, scurvy weakens your immune system. And so it's going to contribute to the onset of other infectious diseases. And it's not just individual immunity that declines, community resistance to, to disease declines as well. As the famine worsened, social structures broke down. So the formal and informal support networks that provided aid and medical care broke down as well. As food supply declines in the famine, there are changes in food distribution, and that is to the disadvantage of the poor, uh, the elderly, um, yeah, really any marginalized population. As food quality and quantity declines, digestive diseases increase. People become desperate, they eat things they shouldn't. Uh, so in Ireland, people ate spoiled food, they ate seaweed, they ate wild plants, they ate decomposing animals, they ate nettles, they ate moss. These things can attack the digestive system and cause a variety of disorders. Even relief efforts could backfire um, and contribute to digestive issues. So famously early in the crisis, the government imported cornmeal to provide like a fairly cheap source of food to people. Um, they imported this from the United States, um, but cornmeal was entirely unfamiliar to the Irish population and they didn't know how to prepare it very well. They didn't have the wheat flour to mix with it. And so it actually contributed to digestive issues. Um, food scarcity also led to increased mobility. The Irish famine famously began a massive wave of external migration, but there's internal migration as well. People would leave or uh, be evicted from their homes uh, and then go in search of food or work. Mobility increased mortality for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it exposes you to new disease environments, as we'll see later this evening. Uh, but the other is that hygiene and sanitation are just difficult to maintain when you are mobile. Uh, and so the increase in uh, what is broadly called fever uh, and what was called road fever at the time, and which as I'll talk about is really just typhus fever, can be attributed to that. Many of these phenomena were recorded in 1851 by Sir William Wilde, who's um, the source of a lot of our information on this. Uh, Wilde was a surgeon and author and is probably best known as the father of Oscar Wilde. Um, in 1851, he was the assistant census commissioner and he wrote a detailed analysis of mortality during the famine. He recorded that the closest ties of kindred were dissolved. The most ancient and long cherished usages of the people were disregarded. Food the most revolting to human palates was eagerly devoured. The once proverbial gaiety and lightheartedness of the peasant people seemed to vanish completely. He said, it is scarcely possible to exaggerate in imagination what people will do and are forced to do before they die from absolute want of food. For not only does the body become blackened and wasted by chronic starvation, but the mind likewise becomes darkened. The feelings callous, blunted, and apathetic and a peculiar fever is generated, which becomes but too well known to the medical profession in Ireland at this time. He recorded people eating dead cattle, dogs, and horses, surviving on wild herbs, watercresses, shamrocks, and seaweed, and noting that this led to fatal consequences. He recorded the order that epidemic diseases came upon the nation, fever, scurvy, diarrhea, dysentery, cholera, influenza, ophthalmia. Now, as a mid-19th century physician, his understanding of the causes of these conditions is, of course, different from our own. And he talks about a variety of factors that he thinks is causing all of these um, different diseases to appear within the country. Um, he notes the emotional effects of witnessing, witnessing such suffering, uh, parents witnessing the lingering starvation of their offspring, and how this trauma could have uh, fatal effects on the human frame, in his words. Uh, but he also discusses things like overcrowding, um, overcrowding in cities or in the public works and how this would have contributed to the spread of pestilence in some way. He wrote that when once epidemic disease has sprung up under any of the foregoing circumstances, experience proves that it will spread rapidly and extensively unless checked by moral combined with physical treatment, such as the substitution of hope and happiness for misery and despondency 
of nutritious and was of paramount consequence, a custom dietary for the unusual, insufficient, and nutritive, and often unpalatable food, which want and necessity may have forced upon the people. So in his uh, mind, treatment requires quarantine, it requires better diet, uh, but he also gives a lot of weight to the emotional impact of the famine and how this probably affected disease outcomes. Now, at this point, I uh, should talk about some of the diseases that we're discussing. And one of the more common uh, causes of famine deaths is, of course, dysentery, right? We now use dysentery to refer to um, amoebic or bacillary dysentery. Um, but again, this is pre-germ theory, so they don't know the cause. They simply know the symptom. Um, dysentery refers to any condition um, which causes inflammation of the colon and frequent passage of bloody stool. The most likely cause in this era is going to be bacillary dysentery right, um, spread by flies, by direct contact, or by water pollution. The severity of symptoms can vary. It would include things like nausea, aching limbs, and fever. Uh, but of course, its main symptom is bloody diarrhea, hence its more common name was the bloody flux. Dysentery has plagued human populations for centuries, particularly in encampments, military camps, we're always prone to huge outbreaks of dysentery. Dysentery has killed more soldiers than bullets probably ever will. Um, the bacteria, um, which causes this, causes intestinal upset, and it can predispose people to other infections as well. So even if dysentery doesn't kill you, it will weaken you. Dysentery is rendered more likely by famine conditions. You would be exposed to this bacteria all the time in the mid 19th century. You're more likely to become infected when you're already weak. During the winter of 1846 to 1847, dysentery was prevalent among the destitute. One doctor in West Cork noted that the pulse of those suffering was almost entirely absent. The extremities of the body were livid and cold, the face haggard and ghost-like, the voice barely audible and reminiscent of the cholera wine. The smell from evacuations was almost intolerable and was similar to putrid flesh in hot weather and that discharges continued unabated until the body wasted to a skeleton. Smallpox um, also appears epidemically in a very malignant form during the Great Famine. Uh, that, as you might be aware, is no longer an active infection thanks to a massive global vaccination campaign that I would assume some people watching this and some people in the audience might in fact remember. Um, it, it, it was of course an acute viral disease transmitted by airborne droplets. The characteristics of smallpox were high fever, headache, pain in the back and muscles, vomiting and convulsions. Uh, but of course, it's mostly known for the outbreaks on the skin, the pustules, uh, which itched quite a bit, formed an intense rash, uh, dried and crusted after its first eruptions and usually left people scarred for life, um, often leading to blindness as one consequence because it would spread and affect your eyes um, and uh, infertility in males. Fever uh, was another of the common causes of death, which of course now we think of fever as more of a symptom, um, but that's not the understanding then, right? There was a long history of malignant fever causing excess mortality in Ireland dating back to the 12th century. Um, a fever is uh, even what kills Molly Malone in the famous song, right? Um, fevers occurred most commonly during times of war and famine. Um, but that wasn't really understood at the time. Instead, a lot of medical practitioners in the mid 19th century in Ireland um, traced the outbreaks of fever to some kind of atmospheric phenomenon that they called the epidemic constitution. One outbreak of fever in 1848 was attributed to, uh, by a physician to Aurora Borealis shining too brightly. Yeah. Um, now in reality, of course, the cause of this is typhus fever, uh, including by the way, Molly Malone, that's probably what happened to her too. Uh, typhus uh, is a group of infectious diseases also spread by bacteria that is spread by common parasites, specifically in this case, lice. Uh, there are other forms spread, spread by fleas, mites, and ticks, but the most common epidemic typhus would be what is spread by lice. It enters the body through scratches on your skin. A lice bites you, you scratch, it enters your bloodstream. The symptoms are a high fever, rash, body aches, mental confusion, prostration. Typhus came in two forms, the general typhus fever and, and then a relapsing form, form of typhus fever. In fatal cases, death usually occurs about two weeks in after the heart gives out. Um, those who survive uh, see their fever break after about five to six days. 
uh, and enter a period called that they would call at the time getting the cool as their temperature drops, they've experienced this relief. If you have a relapsing case of typhus, your symptoms might appear again after a week or so, and then, you know, how it goes. Uh, during the Great Famine, relapsing fever was most prevalent amongst the general population, while members of the, the upper class and relief works tended to contract this single deadly typhus fever. Particularly vulnerable were doctors, clergymen, any relief workers. It's likely that the poor had more exposure to long-term typhus, and so that's why they get relapsing fever, while middle and upper class relief workers were less likely to have been exposed before, they're less likely to have had lice. Um, and so they get it more deadly, right? The relationship between famine and fever is complex and there's no direct nutritional connection. Instead, vagrancy, as well as overcrowding and neglect of personal and domestic hygiene create the optimum social conditions for this infestation. In the late 1840s, uh, infected lice feasted on the unwashed and susceptible skin of the hungry uh, multiplied in their clothing and went forth, carried the length and breadth of the country by a population who was taken to the roads by vagrancy. Um, those who had been evicted, abandoned their homes, must take the roads and travel to workhouses nearby. And as they are doing so, they are either being exposed to these lice or they are spreading them. Lice find new and unresisting hosts at food depots and relief works, at social and religious gatherings and in public institutions such as prisons and workhouses. Reports from various parts of the country suggested that the first stage of this fever was relatively mild. An account from Inish Boffin stated the initial attack was so slight that the afflicted walked or staggered about with it. Um, a Dublin doctor related that many passed through the fever while they were literally walking about. A characteristic um, was the hunger displayed by patients after the attack had ended. One nurse from Queens County said the hunger was in their hearts. When the relapse occurred, it was invariably more prolonged and severe. A county Limerick doctor reported that the relapse stage was long, from 10 to 14 days, very severe, attended with great debility and protestation of strength. These recurring bouts of fever weakened an already debilitated population and left them vulnerable to other infections. Infectious diseases like fever, dysentery, and smallpox terrified the poor and with good reasons because these afflictions pauperized when they did not kill. They reduced the most vulnerable to even greater misery. Fever has a devastating impact on the existence of the poor. Each attack left people weaker, would last weeks and weeks. Fever might persist in one poor man's cabin for months on end. Convalescence was slow and tedious, taking weeks or more, six weeks or more, by which time a single wage earner's family is reduced to absolute poverty. And so illness drove people into pawn shops, compelled them to sell their meager possessions, um, and of course, reduces them to vagrancy and begging. Within Ireland, one in response to these epidemics was to rely on fever hospitals, which predate the famine by several years, dating to about 1843 is when the first of these are built. They were actually a part of the poor law passed in 1838. And so they are supported by poor rates uh, and open to anyone who resides within the specific geographic poor law union. Um, there were pre-existing county fever hospitals, um, although not every county had one. So you're more likely to have had one depending on the size of your city, right? Uh, they're mostly funded through local subscriptions. All of these institutions become desperately overcrowded during the famine. The attitude towards fever hospitals could really be quite mixed because they're often seen as sources of infection, which they kind of are, of course. Um, so there was opposition to building or enlarging existing fever hospitals. In 1847, a proposal to build one in County Galway faced enormous local opposition. Locals argued that it would place them in, quote, the greatest peril, saying the site was too close to their town. Uh, and so, of course, responses like that are motivated by fear. Um, but at the same time, there were always calls for electing new fever hospitals, and the ones that were already existed um, were massively overcrowded. On top of this, there is, of course, a worldwide cholera pandemic from 1846 to 1860, which hits Ireland in 1848. This is the third cholera pandemic of the 19th century, and the disease had hit Ireland before, 
Um, but how Ireland, how cholera was spread was not understood at the time, okay? Um, it's only in 1854 that a London physician, John Snow, identifies an infected water pump in Broad Street in London as the source of an outbreak there. And so the idea that cholera is spread by infected drinking water isn't spread until six years after this outbreak in Ireland and everywhere else, right? And even then uh, in 1854, that was actually a very controversial theory because he couldn't prove any kind of causative agent. Um, so it takes years for this to be affected. Instead, it's thought that it's bad air, that it's the poor habits of the poor, and that's why they're more prone to developing cholera. In reality, of course, it's a bacterial infection that leads to extensive, intense, watery diarrhea, vomiting, and muscle cramps, causing severe dehydration, uh, which is eventually what uh, leads to death. Now, epidemic disease does not only spread in Ireland, it also spreads abroad, traveling with Irish immigrants. Um, Irish famine immigrants arrived in their new homes, not only desperately poor, but also very ill. And the perception of the Irish as a group that was not only poor, but riddled with disease has a big effect on how they're perceived and how they're treated. Now, one factor that contributes uh, to the ill health of the Irish on, on arrival is the conditions in which they are traveling. Um, the ships in which uh, Irish famine immigrants travel are famously called uh, coffin ships. This was the cheapest way across the Atlantic, but of course they're very crowded, they're very unsanitary, there's minimal food and water provided, and so it's an ideal environment for disease transmission. Robert White was a passenger on one of these ships in 1848, and he published an account of his voyage. Of his fellow passengers, he noted, many of them appeared to me to be quite unfit to undergo the hardship of a long voyage, but they were inspected and passed by a doctor, although the captain, as he informed me, protested against taking some of them. A few days into his voyage, he reported that two women had taken ill. That illness then developed into a bad fever. And the patients begged for more water, but they couldn't be granted. They didn't have enough on board. The fever then spread. Uh, there were 110 immigrants on board White Ship, and within a month, 50 people were sick. This fever was called ship fever. Uh, but of course, it's the same as the road fever I was just describing. Upon arrival in Canada, White Ship was then quarantined along with a line of other vessels. Uh, arriving at the same time at Gross Isle, an island in the St. Lawrence River uh, on the way to Quebec. Immigrant ships had to pass medical inspection there and ships with fever cases like whites were expected to fly a blue flag uh, and often had to wait days for inspection. White complained that they were within reach of help but were left to be enveloped in, seeking in reeking pestilence, the sick without medicine, medical skill, nourishment, or so much as a drop of pure water. When two priests visited White Ship, they told them the conditions were much worse in other vessels. The wretched immigrants crowded together like cattle and corpses remained long unburied. There was a typhus epidemic um, in Canada in 1847, uh, about 20,000 deaths in Canada in total, mainly concentrated in cities like Quebec, Montreal, Kingston, and Toronto. And most of those who died were Irish immigrants who had been transferred to fever hospitals or fever sheds um, in those cities as the overcrowding at depots like Gross Isle became a huge issue. Um, although as in Ireland, it doesn't only hit Irish immigrants, um, it also hit those who cared for the sick. The Bishop of Toronto, Michael Power, died in 1847 of typhus that he con contracted while ministering to Irish immigrants. There was a similar outbreak in New York City, which I'll be discussing. Um, most of these cases were contracted on the Atlantic crossing. There's also an outbreak in England as well, and I'll be talking about Liverpool. Uh, basically, there are typhus outbreaks anywhere that Irish immigrants went, which is a lot of places. Um, but I'm going to focus on Gross Isle, on New York, and on Liverpool. The plan at Gross Isle was that each immigrant would be inspected by a doctor before being released and passengers on white ship dressed in their best clothes and helped to clean the ship to try and get released sooner. With so many passengers and ships to inspect, many doctors uh, did only perfunctory exams uh, and so many people might have had a latent fever, they might have had the relapsing version, uh, they're easily able to pass through, right? Because of the sheer number of ships arriving and the sheer number of sick people on board, 1847 became a crisis point for Gross Isle. 
The quarantine station had been built in 1832 for a cholera epidemic, and it proved inadequate to the scale of people it was dealing with in 1847. The medical superintendent wrote to the governor general calling attention to the unprecedented state of illness and distress amongst Irish passengers. Over the course of 1847, until the river was closed by ice um, in October of that year, um, a total of 441 ships arrived, 5,000 passengers died on board. The quarantine station removed 2,200 corpses from the ships. Um, if you died more than 30 kilometers away, the body was thrown overboard. They examined 90,150 immigrants uh, who passed through uh, and buried 5,424 over the course of the year. Because of overcrowding at Gross Isle, ships were rerouted, rerouted to uh, Port Saint, Point St. Charles in Montreal, and an additional 6,000 Irish immigrants died and were buried there. As White reported, and as is backed up by many accounts, uh, ships were left waiting for days before people were allowed to disembark. Uh, the procedure was for the ill to be placed in a hospital and for the healthy to be quarantined in sheds. They just didn't have the space for all of that. Um, the island became quickly overwhelmed. Tents were set up to house the influx of people, but many new arrivals were left lying on the ground without any shelter. Conditions were dirty and overcrowded. Drinking water had to be carted in to the island and there was never enough. Um, to assist in the care, the Catholic clergy of Quebec was called upon. In particular, several orders of nuns took on nursing duties. Uh, the Sisters of Charity or the Grey Nuns uh, recorded their experience in their annals. Um, and they're a powerful contemporary description of the crisis. Um, at what point it notes, quote, our mother was immediately led by an employee to the main hospital. Good God, what a spectacle. Hundreds of people, most of them lying naked on planks, men, women, and children, sick, moribund, and cadavers. In addition to the sisters, there were hired employees, but never enough. And the annals record being overloaded with tasks saying, quote, words are lacking to express the hideous state in which the sick found themselves. Up to three of them in the same bed or cot to be more exact. When touring the sheds, we would find cadavers exhaling an insufferable infection lying in the same bed as those that still breathe. Mm. Over time, more sheds were constructed and the sick were separated into men, women, children, and an additional shed for convalescents. The annals recorded the sisters suffering from exhaustion and, of course, themselves falling victim to the contagion. The spread of typhus became such a concern that another order, the Sisters of Providence, came to provide assistance. And safety regulations were established. Nuns were ordered when they finished working for the day to wash themselves and change clothes immediately. Um, what the annals record is, however, that they were, quote, still infected by the odor they brought back from the sheds. And of course, in reality, it's just they'd still gotten bitten by the lice. Um, so the gray nuns were not alone. Other orders do assist them and they also fell ill. Um, in 1898 account of the typhus epidemic reported that 51 priests, um, were directed to gross Isle or towards the Marine hospital, um, in the city, uh, and that 25 caught typhus and five died. An account of the sisters of Providence, uh, recorded how they came to be involved describing that as too many of the gray nuns became ill, quote, Monsignor Bourget then thought of our sisters and came himself to the asylum. This is normally um, not an order that went out into the community uh, to make appeal to their devotion. That was on the 24th of June. He assembled the community, which comprised at that period, 19 professed, 19 novices and 14 postulants. He laid before them the pitiable conditions of the sick and asked if is any amongst them were willing to sacrifice themselves and risk their lives in caring for these unfortunates. And as he asked that question, all rose and with one voice answered together, I am ready. 27 of them got typhus, nine received last rites, three of them died. Now, the connection between Irish famine um, and epidemic typhus was so strong that it does come to be called Irish fever in this period. Although that term does not come from Canadian press, it seems to have first originated in British press. Um, after a wave of Irish famine migrants to Liverpool resulted in a typhus epidemic there as well. Now, Liverpool had long been a common destination for Irish immigrants, just geographically, it's very convenient to get there. Um, 
1847, uh, it also had a high re uh, reputation for high mortality and unsanitary conditions, particularly in the slum areas of the city. In 1843, the physician William Duncan called Liverpool the most unhealthy town in England. Duncan particularly attacked the housing of Liverpool's poor neighborhoods and its Irish neighborhoods. Um, this map is from 1865. These yellow areas are where there was high mortality from a typhus epidemic then, um, but that roughly corresponds to 1847 years as well and where there would be Irish immigrant populations then too. Um, the famine exacerbated conditions in crowded slum parts of the city. As early as January 1847, the city was experiencing a typhus epidemic. The Liverpool Mercury noted that it was, quote, the influx of thousands of wretches from Ireland that were overwhelming the fever wards in the city's charity hospitals. Fever sheds were hastily constructed outside of the city's workhouses to try and separate the infected. They also constructed lazarettos on the river to serve as floating fever hospitals. Um, and they imposed a temporary quarantine on ships from Ireland. Um, but still, only a portion of sick Irish immigrants wound up in hospitals. Many stayed in their homes and died there, uh, contributing to a high death rate in those neighborhoods of the city. Uh, the town vestry hired medical officers to visit the poor in their homes, and that spring, several district medical officers themselves died of typhus. Liverpool's Catholic clergy experienced similar costs. By the summer of 1847, 10 local priests had died of typhus. Uh, after visiting the homes of fever victims. The typhus epidemic largely ran its course in Liverpool by the fall of 1847, but at enormous cost. Duncan estimated that 5,239 people died in the parish of Liverpool itself uh, from typhus fever, another 2,200 from diarrhea, 380 from smallpox, 380 from measles. In 1848, Liverpool also experienced the cholera epidemic, which Irish famine migrants may have been bringing over, but there was already epidemic cholera in England. So I don't know that you can really trace that one as well. Um, there was widespread cholera. Fever sheds and hospitals built the year before were quickly expanded to take in cholera patients. Uh, but at its height, 572 people were dying from cholera a week within the city of Liverpool. Uh, now, Irish famine immigrants, of course, go to Canada, they go to Liverpool, um, but uh, the United States is probably the most popular destination. The historical archaeologist Meredith Lynn has argued that in America, the identification of Irish immigrants with typhus was so strong that it helped to foster notions of Irish difference and contributed to notions of their lesser humanity. Because how typhus actually spread is, of course, not understood. Um, it's caused by it's called by different names. I've already called it road fever. I've called it ship fever. You might have called it jail fever. You might have called it camp fever. But when you start calling it Irish fever in English and American press, that's a pretty big shift from identifying it with how where it is spread with a group of people who are seen to be spreading and carrying it. It dehumanizes that group of people. The first wave of Irish immigrants went to places like Liverpool and Quebec. So when large numbers of Irish immigrants began to arrive in New York City, public health officials expected a typhus epidemic. In response to a wave of immigration and to try and prevent an epidemic, the government tightened passenger laws and immigrant ships, reducing the number of people a ship landing in a US port could carry by 50% compared to British passenger laws. The theory, of course, is that fewer passengers mean less crowding, more air circulation, better sanitation, et cetera. It also reduces the number of emigrants arriving per day, which is another factor here. British ships had been built to carry cargo. Frequently, they had been built to carry slave cargo, likely. Um, the US policy here does seem to have reduced instances of typhus on ships going to New York. Um, the average number of sick per thousand passengers in 1847, 1848 on an American ship was 9.6 compared to 30 on um, a British licensed ship. American cities also expanded their quarantine and hospital facilities to isolate new arrivals. Until the 1850s, immigrants arriving in the port of New York judged to be sick were sent to a quarantine hospital on Staten Island or to the um, Marine Hospital in Red Hook, Brooklyn. In 1847, in response to the need for more facilities, the New York State created the Commission of Emigration 
and the state emigrant refuge on Ward's Island. These facilities only held about 1,500 patient, patients each, so that really wasn't enough. And often city hospitals do take on the overload, so Bellevue and New York Hospital would accept patients as well. As at Gross Isle, exams are often cursory. Um, you look at someone's tongue, check their fever, that sort of thing, right? Quarantine hospitals were meant to be isolated, but they did still inspire opposition. In 1858, in response to plans to expand the Staten Island Hospital, Staten Islanders burned the hospital to the ground. Um, the association with typhus um, exacerbated nativist views. Oh, sorry, yeah, here we go. Um, um, so as we can see, right, there are typhus outbreaks in years with high Irish immigration, right? And this association exacerbates nativism, right? Now, it's not the only factor because nativism was a broad sentiment for many in this period. Um, and the Irish were a large segment of immigrants beginning in the 1840s. And so they are popular targets for animosity and violence. Some of this is about class. Irish famine immigrants were poor, uh, often desperately so emaciated, dirty, and poorly clothed. An article in the Christian Examiner wrote that, quote, the ill-clad and destitute, destitute Irishman is repulsive to our habits and to our tastes. We confound ill-clothing and destitution with ignorance and vice. Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, yes, that one, the writer, uh, his reaction to Irish immigrants was, quote, you behold them disgusting and all moving about as when you raise a plank or log that has long lain on the ground and find many vivacious bugs and insects beneath it. Now, just to be clear, uh, there are plenty of people who react to these things with sympathy, uh, but also there are plenty who experience that reaction. Fear of contracting the disease is part of this, but not the only part of it. Right. Uh, William Smith, an immigrant recovering from both typhus and dysentery, was denied lodgings because he was told that his looks were too frightening. Uh, on a railway car, people moved away from him, fearful to sit next to him. Fear of catching disease from Irish immigrants plays a role um, in how Irish immigrants were treated upon arrival. Um, at, there was also a significant amount of literature at the time that was concerned with categorizing the Irish as racially different and attempting to use these racial differences to explain the prevalence of typhus amongst Irish immigrants. Race science was popular in the 19th century because it conveniently justifies systemic inequalities. You might be familiar with cartoons like this, which portray the Irish with the uh, simian features. Um, you might, these portrayals are part of this. Uh, race scientists have to work a bit with the Irish though because of course, in reality, there aren't really external physical differences between the Irish and other European ethnicities. William Smith might not have looked great upon arrival, but you give him a new suit of clothes and a couple of good meals, and you're not gonna be able to tell the difference between him and anyone from anywhere else, right? Um, so instead, one popular theory in the mid 19th century was to explain the prevalence of typhus through the theory of temperaments. Uh, now, temperament theory can be traced back to Hippocrates, so the ancient Greek guy, um, and the concept of the four humors. Hippocrates' theory, of course, was that blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, um, and if you have too much or too little of one of those things, it's what causes disease, right? That theory had been expanded by Galen, an ancient Roman physician who began to use the four humors to also address personality. The basic idea was that a preponderance of a particular humor created a certain temperament or bodily disposition, which made a person more susceptible to particular behaviors, emotions, and diseases. So one could be phlegmatic, uh, which meant a predominance of phlegm. Uh, your element is water, your season is winter, you are cold, wet, and you are also confident, rational, and consistent. Uh, Americans like think of themselves as phlegmatic. <laughs> um, meanwhile, uh, the Irish were uh, characterized as sanguine. Um, energetic, emotional, maniacal. Uh, the stereotype of the Irish is hot tempered uh, dates back many, many centuries. You can find it in Edmund Spencer writing in the 1580s, right? Uh, you can even find it in beloved college fighting Irish. Um, 
The physician R.V. Pierce wrote in 1889 that sanguine people tend to destructiveness, the gratification of animal indulgence, intemperance, and debauchery. Uh, one part of the theory of temperaments is that sanguine people, because they are easily excitable uh, and hot in nature, are particularly susceptible to fever. So typhus fever is a dramatic consequence of their basic nature. Now, these nativist prejudices played out in medical treatment. Uh, case books for mid-19th century New York hospitals show that doctors were more likely to diagnose Irish-born patients with typhus fever than either their US-born patients or, uh, perhaps for a better comparison, their German-born patients, right? There's also a wave of German immigration in this period, right? But the Germans were tend to be thought of as phleg um, the phlegmatic, the good one, you know? Um, Based on an analysis of mortality rates among those US and German born patients, Meredith Lynn has concluded there was likely significant misdiagnoses because you overlook symptoms of typhus and instead would diagnose with simple fever. And the treatments for simple fever, just a regular flu uh, versus typhus fever are gonna be really different. The diagnosis of simple fever led to being prescribed cold water and rest. Uh, a diagnosis of typhus fever leads to you being prescribed mercury, which is really bad for you, don't take that. Um, the believed predisposition of the Irish to typhus could also be used to excuse excess deaths on board famine ships. One captain argued to the Liverpool Mercury that he was not responsible for the 25 passengers who died on his ship while traveling to New Orleans, even though he had violated passenger laws and overloaded the ship uh, because of the debility and previous habits of those on board. Once in the United States, um, Irish immigrants would also face different types of threat from fever, specifically uh, yellow fever, which was endemic to Southern port cities where many Irish immigrants disembarked in large numbers. Um, many Irish immigrants found themselves in ports like New Orleans, Charleston, and Savannah, good places to settle after fleeing a famine, find good jobs there if they can, uh, but also those places have yellow fever. During an 1854 outbreak of yellow fever in Savannah, 293 of 650 fatalities were Irish. During an 1853 outbreak in New Orleans, well, uh, you can see, actually, um, the disease appeared first in the Irish immigrant community and yellow fever in all of these cities hit the Irish immigrant community hardest. Now, in this case, Irish immigrants are not arriving with the disease, although they were accused of bringing the disease with them, um, but they're more susceptible for a variety of factors that I'll talk about. The actual cause of yellow fever is of course a mosquito, uh, which transmits the disease through biting with symptoms appearing three to six days later it damages the liver, which causes a characteristic jaundice, hence it's called yellow fever. Uh, the arrival of large numbers of Irish immigrants was already viewed with suspicion in these cities as in every American city. One New Orleans physician compared Irish immigrants to a plague of locusts. Uh, the first fatality of the New Orleans epidemic was a young man from Ireland named James McGigan, uh, who had arrived just 17 days before. Uh, Instances like this contributed to the idea that the Irish had carried the disease with them, which of course, there is no yellow fever in Ireland. They had not, obviously. Um, in 1854 in Savannah, 23 year old Bartholomew Stevens died only two weeks after arriving in the city from Ireland. 25 year old Michael Bennett died a mere 10 days after his arrival. Uh, they got bit by those mosquitoes right away. At the time, the spread of disease amongst Irish immigrants was attributed to their immoderate lifestyles. One newspaper spoke of the miserable, filthy, loathsome manner. Another referred to the Irish as a set of rum drinking, fighting people. Physicians argued that disease could be combated by raising the social and moral condition of the groups it affected. If Irish immigrants led a more orderly life, they would not be so highly affected. These explanations serve to both confirm and reinforce existing prejudices. Yellow fever was sometimes called the stranger's disease, and you can see why by looking at this chart, right? Um, but actually, it's not that the Irish aren't from New Orleans, okay? Um, that's, it's a bit more than that, right? It's not that they're not acclimatized to New Orleans. It's the stranger's disease because in this case, 
these strangers are disproportionately male in their 20s working outside in a very hot environment, perhaps removing their shirts, rolling up their sleeves, right? They're also living in swampy grounds, places where mosquitoes thrive, right? The Irish were susceptible, not because of anything else about them and not because of their sanguine nature, uh, but because of the conditions in which they lived and worked. So the Irish are not, of course, the only group in American history to be subject to medical even at our present one. Later immigrant groups also face similar prejudices, particularly when their timing of arrival coincides with the prevalence of a disease. Uh, for example, Italian immigrants were stigmatized as carriers of polio um, in the early 20th century because there happened to be polio at the time, right? Prejudice can be backed by science, right? And it can be used to justify pre-existing prejudices against people already perceived to be foreign or different. Um, I teach a history of medicine class at Siena, and one of the things we stress there uh, is that medicine is a social institution. Um, it is created by the societies uh, that it exists within, and it can be used to reinforce or to justify prejudices and inequalities. And we can see that in the perceptions and the experiences of Irish immigrants uh, in this era. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Well, it would vary a lot, but one of the really common methods was assisted emigration. Um, so a lot of landlords encouraged their tenants or they paid for their tenants' passages um, as a way of uh, sort of clearing their estates, but also sort of because there were tax laws that made it advantageous um, if you did so. Yeah, so and that was really common was assisted immigration. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I was looking at the slide that you have here, the yellow paper, the German immigrants. Mm -hmm. Why so low to them? They were an immigrant population too, could have been working outside. Oh, well, the German immigrants, as you see, are actually still quite high. The French uh, are quite low, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so still very high with German, but you know, again, as with the typhus fever for a whole variety of reasons, and one would certainly be religion, uh, German immigrants aren't stereotyped in the same way, so they didn't face the same amount of prejudice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they but yeah, they are facing the same amount of yellow fever, and likely, by the way, a similar prevalence of typhus fever too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not sure if anyone is commenting on I maybe we'll stop here and share so that we can see if there's a oh yes. Mm -hmm. So if there's anyone you know online that wants to ask a question, please do. But um yeah, I think this has been great. Thank you, you know, we um as I say it's part of the the whole system that we're doing. This this um promotion is called communities for immunity, and so you know, actually um Dr. Sonna Nisha Sonna Nisha was talking about the uh the history of medicine and i think that's very important you know that um while we looked last week at communities and how they were affected very recently you know so we had some indigenous peoples we had um a, a gay and lesbian group in boulder colorado we've talked about the asian hate that kind of came out of the pandemic it's interesting that all of those kinds of marginalized peoples in the 19th century were experiencing the similar problems because the the stigma of being ill um so if there are no other questions, and thank you for joining us online, thank you for our audience here. Don't forget on Saturday, we have our pop-up vaccination clinic with um, John McDonald and Mara's Pharmacy. So you can come down. If you're due for a booster, you can get it. If you want a, a normal flu shot, you can get that. And if you have not been vaccinated and wish to get your first dose, we will have those too. Uh, everybody who attends will get a swag bag and those people who are here tonight will get a swag bag. And uh, then our final, lecture installment on this series will be the 30th of November, where we will have um, various faculty from the Albany College of Pharmacy to talk about science in the pandemic and the evolution of vaccines, the mRNA technology, um, mandates and ethics and all that kind of great uh, epidemiology stuff. As well. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, what have we, tomorrow night we have an Irish writer, Keelan Hughes, who will be with us
both, uh, you know, live and on person. She's going to be going to the writer's retreat downstate later this week, but she'll talk about her new book. And then on the 18th, I'm speaking at Olana, uh, Beyond the Butler's Pantry, uh, Irish servants, you know, in, in Olana. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh,